hey, thanks everyone for coming to the share what you know session. We've got a couple of people who showed up live, more that will um, show up as we go. And many who watch the recording in the Talking Health Tech community as well. This session is one of um, a masterclass series that has been running in collaboration with Neutromics. But I just noticed my small children's pile of uh, toys on the right hand side there is in view. So I'm going to zoom my camera in a little bit. There we go. Um, <laughs> it ruins the illusion of, of how pristine my setup is. Um, but the these sessions are, um, yeah, it's, it's great that we've, usually our Share What You Know sessions are held every two weeks in the community on different topics, but we decided to run a masterclass on five different, uh, on one topic over five series this is the fourth of fifth i think uh cool. and then the last one we're doing is a bit of a panel session to like to summarize everything in uh next week next week so we just had a different timing of things but you can see all the dates for that in the talking health that community um so a bit of etiquette for those that are here live today you're welcome to have cameras on or cameras off it's up to you um uh, there's going to be slides and Rosie will take through most of it. But as I've seen Rosie do a few now, very much open to conversational comments as we go. But if you're not talking, then you can go on mute. But um, I think there's time for questions afterwards too. But we also use the chat um, as well, if you want to drop something in without interrupting the flow of things. And Rosie, I can just jump in um, in breaks and let you know how the chat's going, if there's anything happening there. Um, right. Anything else before we get going? No. Cool. So over to you, Rosie. Thank you. And thanks for another opportunity to share what I know. So I'll just share my screen. And oh. let's start. Is that all good for everyone? Uh, I can see it in presentation mode. It looks like it's about to load or it might be my computer being slow i'm not sure oh i don't know i'll just stop sharing because i'm not quite sure what it's doing oh maybe that one i've got this that looks good okay something's happened to my program because i've got it i've got two slides next to each other i've never seen that before but that's okay so welcome to this um the fourth in the series um, of this masterclass series, it's on IP strategy. As Pete mentioned, I'm happy for you to jump in with questions or comments um, as we go, but I also will stop at the end of each slide just to check that um, in case there's a bit of hesitancy to jump in, you can jump in then as well. Um, so today, hmm. Today, this is just a quick outline of what today, um, today's masterclass is about. I'm going to um, starting with some basics, um, building an IP portfolio, IP, that's a valuable asset, um, developing an IP strategy, and education of the team is important. So starting with the basics. So I think when you're trying to develop an IP strategy, you really need to have a look at and consider what IP is relevant to your company. Um, there's not a one formulaic process for every company. Um, there's different types of patent, um, different types of IP. So there's patents and trade secrets, trademarks and branding, designs and copyright. And in the first session, we covered briefly what, what each of those sort of IP assets would cover. And you might not just have the only one, you might have a combination um, and it might change over time as well. Um, but it's really important to um, think about what's, what's relevant to the company and putting it into a good position. Um, and that leads me on to the second point, and that's identifying what may be the most important type of IP for the company. Um, and it's not just for now, but into the future. So um, there's lots of things that you need to consider when you're building an IP strategy. And a lot of people say to me, but doesn't it cost a lot? And yes, it may cost a lot. And that's why you need to sort of develop your IP strategy and decide what's the most important because 
um, you know, it might be on a budget constraint, but you should always be revisiting that topic. And some things might be worthwhile or more of a high priority to, to protect now because it will give you more value and other things that we'll talk about a bit later on. Um, but you should also be looking to the future, you know, where the company's going and what you're trying to, what your plan and your milestones um, are going to be and protecting that as well. One of the um, very important things that you need to consider is when you're developing IP or when there's IP being developed is that you ensure that you own those rights. Um, and these rights could be um, created by employees, consultants, contractors. Um, so we do need to make sure that, you know, you have the terms and conditions in place for, for any IP that's generated for the company comes back to the company and the company's entitled to that IP. And then, of course, you know, if you are entitled to make sure that you do have it assigned or that there's provisions for it to flow through. Um, in support of some IP rights, you do have to produce evidence of your entitlement. So as it's, my recommendation is, as it's created, is to ensure that you have separate documentation that shows it. For example, um, employee agreements, I think it's common practice these days for them to have clauses about, you know, any IP that they create will, will vest in the company. You don't want to be showing that employment agreement in support if you ever have to before the authorities. So you might want to do a separate simple agreement that you have on file and put with your IP documentation. Um, other ways that you can derive IP is through contractual um, arrangements in addition to consultants and contractors, but, you know, through research and grant agreements. And these aren't always so straightforward, but you do need to consider them and see how the terms relate to the IP um, and what it means. And, you know, they do specify, you know, background IP, you know, resides with whoever brings it to the table, but it talks about, you know, IP development. So under that research or grant, where will it go if something is created? And there could be limitations, such as limitations to the particular technology, um, if it's just on the improvements of the background IP, or, you know, does it extend to all IP? And other things to look out for as well is, you know, whether you're going to be the sole owner of that IP that's generated or whether there'll be a co-ownership arrangement and what impact or um, that that may have on the situation. Um, a few people have asked me in previous sessions and just um, in conversation is whether, you know, some of these terms aren't very favourable. Any contract is negotiable. It's just whether you can bring it to, you know, the position that's good for you. Um, and the other thing, that, you know, in the basic realm is, you know, depending on the company structure and, you know, for example, with Neutromics, we have two subsidiaries. So the consideration was given, um, we needed to give consideration as to which entity will be owning that IP. And there's, there's reasons for that. And you need to consider it, you know, again, now and into the future and how that will progress through. Um, you should also be considering tax implications arising from transfer of IP rights between different entities. Um, think about whether you've got to have an entity overseas and how that might work. And then given all that, um, if that's the case that, you know, whether you need an intercompany assignment from one, from one entity to another entity or any in, um, intercompany licensing arrangements. Is there any questions on that slide? I'm always interested in the whole creating a another entity for IP. And from my own experience, I've seen it only seems to, the only benefit I've seen, well, it's not been a benefit, it's just complicated things. <laughs> it does um, complicate things, but there is reasons for yeah, it. Right, okay. yeah. I might just continue to listen on, but that was just my, my uh, something I've noticed. It seemed to create um, more confusion than anything. The reason for generally, and I'm not a lawyer, I'm a patent attorney, but generally the reason, you know, based on my understanding and from discussions with lawyers is you're trying to keep your assets um, from far reach of any liability claims that might happen. That's why you have liability in one entity and you might have assets in another. So if there's a claim against, you know, for any reason, um, they're claiming on that entity rather than touching your assets. So it's sort of trying to keep it at arm's length. 
I'm going to try this button because I've just lost my mouse. I'm going to go. Oh, have I lost everyone? No. I I've still just, see you. That's right. I've just taken off my big screen because it wouldn't wouldn't transfer my mouse down to. Looks my... even bigger and better now on the slide. So if anything. That... Oh, good. <laughs> so it must have been a setting with. I've got a, a larger screen. Um. Just check that. Yeah. So building an IP portfolio, um, <clears throat> where do you start? Um, it's important to look to the future. So think global. Um, you're thinking about your business activities, where, you, where you're going to first, um, your first market, but where are your other markets? Um, I'm a patent attorney, so particularly with patents, it's not something that you could, you know, seek protection in Australia, for example, if that's where your business activities currently are, and then go, well, in five years' time, I'll, I'll extend that into the, you know, another jurisdiction such as the US because patents need to be filed, you know, all at the same time um, so that, you know, they don't impact on each other. Um, if you want to go back to the, um, I think one of the previous sessions is a bit more in detail about how patents work. Um, whereas on the other hand, trademarks, for example, you could actually file it in Australia first and then later decide if um, once the funds, um, once you've got funds or that you enter those markets, you go into those markets. But, you know, you've always got that um, consideration that someone else might jump in before you. So... I would suggest in building the IP portfolio that you understand the process of the IP that you're seeking to protect, how it gives you coverage, whether it's going to be published, you know, the costs and the timelines and things like that, and what are the requirements. Um, as I just mentioned, you know, markets where, and I have put this as a technology focus because that's where we are, but, um, you know, markets where your product or your technology is likely to be used and to provide the greatest return, where your competitors might be, so you're trying to block that out. Also in those jurisdictions where, you know, the technology might be copied, so it might not particularly be used in that jurisdiction, but it might have... Um, the type of um, demographics where companies in that country have a tendency to copy um, in the pharmaceutical world, whereas where I came from, you know, India and China and places like that where generics were made were highly sought after that, you know, you might not be looking to manufacture or, or, or whatnot, but you have to be careful of um, things being copied. And of course, you need to think of your budget considerations. So not only to pursue and to maintain protection, but if if the need arises that you may need to defend your IP rights. Um, so um, they're the things you might consider when building your IP portfolio. <clears throat> Elsewhere, um, you know, in building an IP portfolio, it's not only what you may generate, you may, you know, it's a good thing to consider licensing technology that might supplement your IP portfolio or even start you off, um, you know, People might, you know, have universities, you know, do research and create IP. Um, it could be an easier way or a cheaper way to actually start you off. Um, if you do think about licensing technology, you know, conduct due diligence to know what is being licensed, um, negotiate terms and conditions that might be favourable to you and understand any obligations that might come out of that licensing arrangement. But, you know, I think, you know, it's not only about building the IP portfolio, you may also buy licensing technology um, or other types of IP, you know, lead to the possibility of developing a key partner to assist you in the development. Um, in the startup world, we have limited resources and funds. So this is a good way to, um, you know, another reason for going into licensing. And of course, as I said, and I keep harping on it, but there's budget considerations for licensing fees and other costs. Um, but also, you know, your ability to make payments for development milestones that may be in there. But, you know, it's all negotiable and it's all about how you build up that relationship. Has anyone got any questions on that slide? Okay. Here we go. IP. It's a valuable asset. IP is usually the most valuable asset of a technology startup. And the reason for this is lots of reasons um, and different reasons as to why you might um, want to develop an IP portfolio. But um, for a lot of startups, it's, it can be essential to obtaining venture capital funding. It may increase a company's valuation. 
um, actively securing your IP rights can maintain competitive position. So, you know, you're trying to get to the forefront and stay there, you know, you filing IP can, one, secure your ability to progress, but also block out others from um, coming into your territory. Um, and if you have a strong IP portfolio, um, you can ensure business flexibility. Um, what I mean by that is you can, in some instances, obtain more favourable terms in collaboration agreements with other companies. Um, if the need arises, you can be an appealing acquisition target. Um, and also, you know, as we've talked about, it can be you can also licence out your IP, whether it's IP you've generated or sub-licensing IP that you've licensed in and therefore create a revenue stream um, while you're still developing your technology or actually even um, to sell your IP if, if it comes up. Is there any questions on that slide? I feel like I'm going very quickly and may, may this may be a shorter session, although it's a very important topic. I actually have a go with a question here, Rosie. Um, in terms of, uh, uh, similar to you, I've come from a medical device and um, uh, pharmaceutical background, so IP is really clear cut. Within softwares, what, 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 is, what can you put an IP against? Is it the code bases? Is it workflows? Is it a combination? Where, and, and how do you, like, how do you go about that, uh, particularly you know, is there a registry basically you can check whether a certain workflow has been, you know, um, IP somewhere around the world? I don't know if you can just shed some light there. They're very good questions. And um, for me, Patrick, I'm, <laughs> I'm a, chemi a chemical patent attorney. So yeah. what I called a IT computer patent attorney to come into Neutromics to have a discussion with us about that. My understanding is that um, the code... I'm not sure about registers for looking for this sort of thing, but I do know that copyright would probably subsist in some coding, um, depending on um, the software and its use. Um, in Australia, we have business methods and there's a way to, there could be a way to protect it through IP. So, you know, patents may need to be considered. Um, so there would be, Patents, a possibility, copyright, I would say definitely. Copyright subsists as soon as it's created, but you can actually register it. Um, and then, you know, there are people, I understand, and I'm not very technological, but, you know, open source type thing where they share, share it, but you have to be careful of the terms, apparently, with that open source. But I would suggest, um, and it's as best as I could do it, that, that speaking to um, someone who has expertise in that area, such as an, um, a patent attorney who deals with that sort of technology, software, computers and the like, um, would be able to give you a more, a more suitable answer that might be more helpful in depth. <laughs> I can only give you a layer. <laughs> No, it's it's good. It's good to know that it is complex. So it's not just something I don't know. It is. I think it's a huge gray area, and we we have a lot of conversations at the round at the moment at at front facing workflows, okay. right? The customer says, "I'm going to create this, but I want to IP that." I'm like, "Well, how do you know you're the only one in the world that has come up with that idea?" And then there is nowhere really to look it up. That's why that that's the context of of my question. So I'm glad. That, that it is complex. That's good. <laughs> I, I would say a workflow would be difficult to protect, but it could be proprietary. But once, you know, if it's out in the public domain, it's a bit hard to say, that's mine, don't use it. And mm. or, or to stop people, you could say it's mine, but, you know, and great that you've created it, but to actually stop people, that's, you know, where the IP protection comes in. It gives you the ability to stop people from copying it. Mm. Um, it might be something I could suggest to Pete to get my friend, my, I might be able to rope him into giving a discussion on this very area because um, it is something I'm not overly familiar with but does, is coming up more and more in this technology age. Um, and we could have questions like that specifically. So we could have it as an add-on into the new thing. I'll put you in touch, Peter. Nice oh, I just heard Thanks, Rosie. Thank you. Um, so developing an IP strategy. Now, there is no formula, as I said at the start, there's no formulaic 
process. And it's a it's one that you know needs to be revisited quite often. You start and then you have to keep looking and revising and change, you know, changing as and pivoting all those words as you go along. Um, and I think it does take quite some years. I mean, some of the you know big, well-established companies would have an IP process. Um, but with startups, it's 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 hard um, and it's changing quite rapidly all the time and needs to be looked at. But these are some things I pulled out that I thought, you know, are considerations um, that we could make. So an IP strategy, strategy is ultimately judged by the value it creates for the business. You know, it does cost a lot, but, you know, it has to create value. If it's not creating value, then it's not working for you. Um, and, you know, it must align to the business strategy and R&D activities and, I think from the start, you need to focus on your priorities and strategic themes and revisit those and, and you know, as you go. And, I, you know, whether I say it's, you know, revisit them every three months, six months, it depends. It, it's, it's not something you create today and forget about tomorrow. And the, the second point there is reg regularly reviewing your IP position and IP portfolio to ensure it's still on track and relevant. It does incur costs. Um, you know, I've seen companies where they file lots of patents and then, you know, they're not even relevant in three years because they've been superseded by other technologies, you know, that, that the company has created themselves. But, you know, you need to know why you're maintaining it. Is it because it still provides some sort of value in that it blocks competitors? you know, where, where is it on the importance list? So that, you know, if you need to review and cull portfolios, um, you know, you know where things stand. And also, you know, when you, when you do filings, you know, you file your R&D, you've, you've created some IP, you file, file in my world patterns on it. Um, does it need to be updated? It's not you can update it, you can't update a pattern, but you know, are you using that technology or have you done further development so that that pattern's no longer giving you any protection? You might need to think about how you need to try and file a further pattern that might still stand up in light of that one, but you need to review it. And it's the same with you know, trademarks and branding. They sometimes you can get the right, you know, brand straight off the bat, like the Nike chick. Um, other times companies have started with something and then, you know, realised it's not really working for them and have to, you know, revisit their portfolio and change it um, or change the colour or the, or the, you know, the logo font or something like that because that's what they're now using in, in practice in commercial the commercial world. Um, in building, in, you know, a strong IP portfolio, you need to build on your IP that's core to, to the technology and put you in a better position. So, you know, there's people go, oh, we can just file everything. Um, but, you know, look at what's core, what's going to give you the protection, what's going to give you the value, prioritise as best you can. Um, and, you know, always be thinking at the back of your mind, where's this going to position the company? Um, one thing I've really not realised, but one thing that's very important is effectively managing an IP portfolio. Um, it can help, you know, in doing so. I mean, Nutramix, like we have an in-house patent attorney, that's me, but, you know, if you, get, if you have external partners to help, you know, get them in to have discussions with them. If you effectively manage an IP portfolio, portfolio, it may help the business to identify opportunities in adjacent markets, new markets or licensing opportunities. It can also, you know, show where there might be gaps that need to be filled, you know, to strengthen the company's position. So there's different ways that, or different things that need to be done to, in relation to this IP strategy. It's not all about just looking at what you need to protect. Um, Another thing is obtaining a wide range of IP rights to ensure business stability. So, you know, it might be only one but you know, there could be others, you know, more than one. So there's, you know, trademarks and branding go together that you might have 
you know, protect patterns, but you might, might also keep things that are trade secrets, you know, confidential. Um, we just spoke about software. So there could be the fact that there's copyright, but also there could be, you know, ways to seek protection um, through patent, through a patent application. So if you have the different types of rights, it actually just builds strength and stability into the company because you've got more, more than one thing um, that's keeping you um, covered. Um, in building and developing your IP strategy, if you've got the ability to, you should conduct searches to gain insights. Now, there's, you know, you can do these types of searches to have, you know, um, look at the competitive landscape, players in the field, technology developments, potential infringers, or, who, you know, with your um, competitors or else or others. Um, and it can help in determining um, making decisions, whether we need, you know, we're developing something and, oh, it's, the, the landscape's too congested, I'm not going to be able to <clears throat> seek patent protection in that area. Um, so we might want to pivot or, or try different, different things. And, you know, searches can be conducted in the patent world. There are particular databases, but there's a lot of free ones as well. Um, they might not be as comprehensive type of searching, um, but you can always start with some sort of searching even on Google for, you know, looking at brand names for particular products or, you know, anything like that. So searching, you know, can be very helpful. Um, might have heard this term, the patent thicket. Um, and that's when companies protect incremental developments to create a patent thicket. So they're trying to, you know, really make it really hard for other competitors to come into that field. So instead of trying to seek Again, I'm focusing on patents, but, you know, seeking um, protection of, you know, if it's a device, the whole widget, you might, you know, separate out the patents um, to particular, you know, to that those particular features um, and then create and build on those. And that sort of just helps to build it up. Of course, it, you know, it, it, you have to have, you know, cost considerations, the, you know, whether you've got the time and capa um, capacity to do that. But eventually when, when those sort of things aren't of much concern, these are things to try and think about. Incremental developments will just, you know, block out those blank bits as much as possible to make it stronger for people to get in and give you that barrier. Um, you could also think about, you know, you're thinking about when you're building your IP portfolio and developing your strategy, you know, the first thing that people think of is, you know, to protect themselves, protect the company. But you should always keep open mind to developing an IP portfolio that can also be licensed. You can carve out fields, carve out technology, um, do carve outs. And that way, as we discussed, or as I mentioned before, you know, if you can license stuff, it might give you a revenue stream to help the startup keep going while it's, you know, continuing to developing its, its core IP. So, you know, be open-minded in the strategy that, yes, first and foremost, you want to build, um, create value for the company and protect the company. But, you know, think about whether there's, there's stuff in your IP portfolio that you can license, um, whether it's, you know, some people have devices or technology that could be used in so many different fields, but, you know, you might be more focused on the healthcare field and it could be an applicable technology in the food industry. So not a competitor, you might then seek partners that might want to license that technology without, you know, impacting on your own, your own um, market and area of interest. Um, and the other thing to think about with the IP strategy is whether, you know, you go for formal IP rights, so patents or versus trade secrets. If it's not something, you know, trade secrets can be patentable subject matter, but some people actually keep it a secret because um, it can be easily reverse engineered um, and, you know, we don't want the patent protection, so you keep it as an in-house thing. But, of course, you know, you've got the requirements that you've got to keep it confidential. A trade secret isn't a secret anymore once it gets out. So there are, you know, advantages and disadvantages advantages to that. I did talk about those sorts of things in one of my earlier sessions, I think the first one. Um, and then there's also this defensive publishing. So with patent rights, once you actually put it into the public domain, it means that someone else can't then 
try, well, they have to negotiate or navigate around that, that disclosure to get their own rights. So it could be that you go put it in the public domain as part of your IP strategy to sort of, you know, hinder, hinder someone else's process in, in building their own um, IP portfolio. Is there any questions to that slide? Um, so Rosie, I have a question that well, seems like a really full on job and it seems like you need someone to be basically involved from conception of the idea of the company. But realistically, from a startup perspective, do you think that, you know, all startups should have in-house lawyers right from the beginning or should they, you know, how, how, and if they can't afford that, how, what can they do to keep someone involved throughout the process? Yeah, it's a really good question, Ryan. And, you know, Neutromix didn't always, you know, Neutromix was about two or three years old before I came on board. Um, but knowing about IP, um, it'd be great if they, you know, if you had it, you were able to afford an in-house lawyer and in-house patent attorney straight away. But, you know, it isn't something that startups do. But, um, you know, learning about IP from an early stage and at least being aware of it and, and thinking about these things um, would be, you know, very advantageous for every startup. And then, you know, you do end up seeking, you know, someone... Startups always go to seek IP at some stage and it's building that rapport and that relationship with a good attorney or a good lawyer, um, a good branding person and, you know, keeping them informed and bringing them on the journey. So they, if they know what your business strategy is and your, you know, what you're thinking about for now in the future, it, it really does help them help you with your IP strategy. Um, you know, when I dealt in, when I was at a firm, you know, you, you just get instructions, particularly from overseas, this is what we're doing and, and you'd be, you know, handling the case. But you didn't know where it fitted into the strategy, whether, you know, whether it was a high priority case for a lot of money to be spent on it and a lot of time and effort or whether it was low priority. But if you had that sort of information, you know, as an attorney, I could have tailored my advice to sort of, you know, rather than the medium ground to try and get a balance, you know, whether giving them the, you know, the short version or a long version. Um, so I think, you know, if you haven't got someone in-house who's looking at this or tasked to look at this is actually, you know, if you're engaged external providers is to build that relationship with them. Um, and, you know, in that, in that chat with them, you know, see, see whether, you know, they can help you with this. Um, tell them that you'd like to keep them on board because you want to, you know, want them to be on the journey with you. And that's why you're giving this information for that purpose. Um, this is one of my last slides before the question slide. So I'm not quite sure how we've gone pretty well on time at the moment. So, but the other thing I think that's really important with the, you know, the IP strategy is, you know, having the team aware of what the IP strategy is. And, and that's across the board, not just your R&D team, but everybody, because everything that everyone does is for the business, you know, objectives and, um, you know, what the business strategy is and you're trying to align to that. But keeping the team informed um, really does help. And if they can see what IP you have, what, what have they got protection with, um, just any sort of way, um, you know, ke keeping them aware of anything that's even related to IP, um, you know, confidential information, how does that actually need to be handled? Definitely whether something's a trade secret not to be revealed, um, you know, the stages of the patterns, whether they're still unpublished documentation, how, how, how IP works and the different types of IP. And that way they can, you know, help with, help with, you know, putting this IP strategy in place for you. And I think as you grow, um, implementing an educational program for the team, just to raise awareness, because, you know, anyone can, anyone can, you know, create IP um, and spot things out there. You know, you, the team is doing everything for you with the business. Um, I've got their raise awareness of IP amongst the team at all levels because I think it comes, you know, 
people at all levels, from low level, mid level to even at senior level should know and understand and be aware of IP and how it plays its role with the company. Um, I mentioned confidentiality just then. It's you know really important for the team to understand what that means, um, what it means keeping things confidential in-house, how to deal with confidential information when it comes from a third party. There are obligations usually that come with that. And, and when you're able to share that information, because sometimes sharing, you know, you share out and it comes back tenfold usually. So, um, you know, it's important that everyone understands what may be the limitations. And I always say, you know, people say, can you give me, you know, what can I and can't I say? And I sort of, sort of you know, the simplest thing is if you don't know, just don't say it at the st and then, you know, come and find out first because once it's out there, um, it's no longer confidential. And, you know, def definitely very much so with the R&D people, but even across the board is, you know, teaching your team how to identify IP, um, to research ideas, do a bit of searching um, and writing about their discoveries. And what I mean there is they don't have to, you know, do it in any complex form, but being able to take notes about, you know, why did they come up with the idea? Why do they think it's important? What do they think it might actually have an impact on the company or, or add value to the company? And then, you know, it can go to the appropriate people to give them more background to identify what is the best way to go forward with that? So yeah, education is important. And I'll go to the next slide because that's questions. Peter, that's all I've got for this IP strategy session. Love it, thank you. Um, open to those in attendance for any questions that they might have. I like how session has built on previous ones that we've had, but it's still something that others can jump in if they've not um, seen all of them. Um, open to Stephen, Kenna, Patrick, Rory, any questions from you guys? Actually, maybe just a question around like, because you mentioned trade secrets and stuff earlier, but if say like, you're part of an accelerator program or something like that when you're actually developing your product and you've been sharing those things not only with you know the people who are going to be investing or running the program but also kind of with other people in your cohort can you actually go back and then do something to protect your trade secrets and IT what, what do you do in that situation? Um, good question, right? Because that probably is where startups, some startups start. But I, I don't know what documentation would be mm. uh, signed before going into an accelerator program. I assume there would be some documentation about confidentiality. Um, and, you know, if it's kept under a confidential realm, I mean, that's quite extended because you probably have, you know, the, the rest of the cohort that you then have to hope that they would maintain confidentiality for you. Um, as long as it's not in the public domain and there's like, there's no blanket of confidentiality, you know, there is, you know, if it's under a blanket of confidentiality, it doesn't matter how big that is. Yes, you could keep it as a trade secret and it probably would be refined to a degree. I don't know how much detail people would disclose. Um, but once it's in, when I say public domain, I mean out there free for anyone to do what they please with it. So um, once it's in that public domain where there's no, you know, it's with someone and they've got no obligation to keep it secret, yeah. then that's it. That's the cat's out of the bag as the saying goes. So, yeah, it's a good question because, yeah, it goes back to, you know, looking at agreements and any discussions, um, you know, you put these agreements in place and you hope that people stick to their obligations because you don't want to go through that journey of mm. having to sue people over it. Because um, that's the thing, you, you ask someone to sign a CDA and if they breach it, well, then you have to take action. It's also bad for them. Um, comes back on them that no one else will, it'll be found out and no one else will sign a CDA with them, but you have to just have to be trust um, and I think in a med tech uh, not med tech but an accelerator type program I think everyone's there with that same level of want of trust so it's reciprocate you know everyone's looking at everyone else 
um, to keep their, their own, you know, discussion secret mm -hmm. or confidential. Cool. That makes sense. Thank you. That's all right. Interesting. Thank you. If there's nothing else, I think we're pretty good then. Uh, we'll tidy up the recording, put it in the community and give a post to everyone who wasn't able to attend live or anyone that wants to come back and watch. Uh, there'll be the other sessions as well that are in there too, which you can go back and check out and we'll put some notes in there as well. But look, um, thank you everyone who showed up live. Appreciate it. And um, yeah. And so we've got the next, the final session in the uh, masterclass is next Monday at one Sydney time. So same time next week. Just to let those who are here know about more about the panel session. So I'll be on the panel and you're probably sick of hearing from me, but we're also got Natalie, who was our um, trademark and branding specialist. And then we've got Eliza from DLA Piper, who's a commercial corporate lawyer. So it could be, well, not could be, it will be a very good opportunity to fly questions at us. Mm -hmm get a very rounded response um, from that. And if you want to send them in beforehand, that'd be great. Um, we can put, sort of categorise them together to get a more um, informative answer. But, you know, feel free to think things and um, come on the day. Fantastic. Love it. Mm. Okay. As always, appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Have a good day. Bye.